Welcome to another Saturday University. Um, if you didn't quite pick it up from Shannon, uh, Saturday University is a cooperation between the University of Wyoming, the Wyoming Humanities Council, and uh, a, a group of local organizations and individuals. Uh, we often work with the National Museum for Wildlife and Art, with uh, Central Wyoming College, who we'd like to thank for their um, cooperation, and uh, the Teton County Library helped us get started here. Uh, we've been coming to Jackson since 2009 to bring you this cooperative uh, morning event, and uh, we have been enjoying coming back every time. Let me introduce our first speaker. Uh, professor Michael Dillon is a professor of zoology and physiology. And, you know, here in Wyoming, we take high altitude for granted. Uh, people living in Jackson are accustomed to 6,200 feet, while we in, Wy in Laramie, you know, we, we deal with 7,200 feet all the time. We don't even think about it. But pause for a minute and think about how much we take that for granted. If you pick up a cake bo mix box, and you'll look on the back for the high altitude instructions, what you'll discover is that we are above the instructions. We're higher than what they think is high altitude. And Michael doesn't take high altitude for granted. He studies insects and investigates their ability to survive, to thrive at altitudes above 5,000 feet, above 8,000 feet, above 12,000 feet, uh, and so on. And he is uh, based here in Wyoming. He's been at uh, UW for, for a decade. Uh, and of course, we give him lots of high altitude, but he travels around the world to even higher places, China, Tibet, and Peru. Uh, but he also works here in Wyoming. He has just become uh, the director of the uh, UW National Park Service uh, research station up in the park and uh, is presently writing a book, the first book to identify a hundred of the bee species here in Wyoming. Um, that's a hundred out of the approximately 700 different species of bees. Michael began his work at a lower altitude, the University of Texas at, at Austin, and then went on to the University of Washington for his PhD and did postdoc work at Berkeley before arriving in UW. And uh, let me introduce Michael then to speak to us about the flight of the bumblebees in cold, thin air. Professor Brown. Great, thank you, Paul. Yeah, and thank you all for coming out. It, it is a gorgeous day out there. Um, I know you'd rather be in the mountains, um, so I'm going to try to show you a whole bunch of pictures of mountains to kind of give you the effect that you're there anyways. Um, as Paul said, I'm, I'm both at the University of Wyoming, but I also direct the research station. How many people have been to that research station? Oh, good, a good number. So if you like this sort of thing, we run a summer seminar series up there um, every Thursday evening from mid-June to mid-August. We have a nice barbecue out on the lawn. This is actually the view from the station. Um, and then after that, we have a talk by some prominent academic about some topic of relevance to this area. So if you're interested in coming to those, uh, send me an email um, and we can add you to the mailing list and, and you have lots of summer stuff to do next year. That season, that's over right now. So the sun's highlighting, as Paul said, one of the things that I think a lot about is high peaks, right? That's Moran there, um, pretty high. Uh, lots of organisms live in these high places. There are many higher places around the world as well. And this fundamental observation motivates a lot of the research I do, okay? The world is not flat. Of course, I mean that just in jokingly, but if you go from these green areas of low elevation all the way up to the brown and the white, you see lots of topographical diversity around the world. And that topographical diversity is really fun and entertaining for us, those of us who like to ski and hike and camp and do all those things in the mountains, but it means really interesting things for the organisms that live in those places. And as people who live in a mountainous area, right, we understand that mountains are challenging. You get up to high, high mountains. So this is standing on a pass in western China at about 4,500 meters elevation. These are the four sisters. They're all six to 7,000 meters high, very, very high peaks. And when you get to these high places, there are lots of things that happen that we know challenge organisms. And I'm gonna ask you guys to participate a little bit today. 
Can anybody name something that changes as you get up, go up a mountain that would challenge an organism? Temperature. Temperature, fantastic. It gets cold, right? What else? Oxygen, yeah, and the oxygen and temperature affect the vegetation. Exactly. There are three main things that I'm going to focus on today that affect organisms that live on high altitudes. Let me mention temperature. As you move up in elevation, temperature falls quite dramatically, about 6 degrees C per kilometer. Okay, so that's a lot. So it can be nice and balmy down low, and you get up high and it's very cold. Because we are aerobic organisms, whoops, wrong button. Because we are aerobic organisms, um, oxygen, falling oxygen with altitude is really important for us. It's difficult to breathe when you get to high elevations. This third one you may not have thought about, and that's because I doubt any of you fly, right? You may fly in airplanes, but you don't yourselves fly. Um, many insects, in fact, most insects are flying, and they have to deal with this reduced air density. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that's a challenge and how they deal with it. Um, so I want to bring some examples of this low temperatures home for you. Hopefully many of you know these stories. We know that when you get to very, very cold temperatures, it challenges survival. A classic um, story is that of Beck Weathers, um, made famous in the Into Thin Air book, and then he wrote his book, Left for Dead Afterwards. As many of you know, he was up on the slope of Everest, kind of got too tired, decided to stop. He went into chill, basically went into a comatose state because of those low temperatures. Somehow managed to wake himself up, get up and get off the mountain. Okay, so he went into this comatose state, recovered from it, but he suffered the consequences. He lost most of his fingers and toes, um, very severe frostbite on his face. So that cold temperature is really, really difficult for humans and for other organisms. The second example again from, from humans I'll give is, does anybody recognize these two guys? You've probably seen them when they're a little older. I'm sure they've come through here. This is Reinhold Messner and Peter Hobbler. So in 1978, they were the first humans to climb, well, the first Westerners to climb to the summit of Everest without oxygen. Okay, in 1978. It hasn't been done much since then. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. When you get to the peak of Everest, oxygen is about a third the value that it is um, at sea level. And so it's very, very difficult to breathe. And he described it later as feeling like he was a single, narrow, gasping lung floating over the mists and summits. Right? To really describe that feeling of the only thing he could think about was how to get oxygen into his system. Right? So oxygen for aerobic organisms um, is, is a very difficult challenge on high mountains. The third one that you may not be more familiar with, but I'll, I'll bring up this example. It's not often that you actually get helicopter rescues from, near, from, from even base camp or higher on Everest. Now, partly that's weather, but it also results from the fact that rotating helicopter blades, when they're up at high elevations, they're encountering fewer molecules because of that reduced air density, right? So it's harder to actually push enough molecules down to create lift and support your weight. So that's a very difficult to fly at high elevations. The first helicopter to touch down on the top of Everest wasn't until 2002. And they had to strip everything out of that helicopter and have a very, very skilled pilot to get up there and do that because he's right on the margin of lift production for that aircraft. So we don't think about that except when we're flying. Flying organisms have to deal with this on a daily basis. Okay. So I know it said in the program you weren't gonna have any quizzes. I do have a quiz for you. So all over the world, we see this topographical diversity such that there are really high peaks all over the world, right? And so what I want to do is see whether or not you guys can recognize the pictures of the seven summits, that is the highest peak on each of the seven continents. And I'm hopeful that you guys will, we'll see. So we're gonna go from the, sh the lowest one. Does anybody know which mountain this is? This is Puncak Jaya. This is in Indonesia, 4,800 meters roughly. Um, most people have not been there, but a really beautiful mountain coming right up from the ocean. What about this one? Doesn't look very tall. Very few people have been here, I'll give you a hint. This is Vincent, Vincent Massive, right, exactly. This is in Antarctica, um, quite high, 16,000 feet, right? Anybody recognize this one? It's in Russia, the Caucasus Mountains. This is Mount Elbrus. Right, so over 5,600 meters high, 18,000 feet. 
This one, there's a clear hint down there. <laughs> Kilimanjaro, exactly, right? African continent, 5895, so over 19,000 feet. What about this one? Everybody should know this one. Denali, Denali exactly, formerly McKinley, right? So this is Denali, um, over 6,000 meters, 20,000 feet high, so we just keep getting higher. What about this one? South America, Aconcagua, okay? Uh, to over 22,000 feet high, right? And then the one that I've already shown you, Everest, is over 29,000 feet high, right? So very, very high. You did pretty well. <laughs> um, okay, so we have these super high places, right? And they're incredibly challenging. I don't think any one of us, well, there are very few of us that think it would be fun to be hanging out up here. It's a very difficult place to be, right? And yet, there are many, many really interesting organisms that live in these high places, and many of them are iconic, right? Everybody recognizes this one, a yak in Asia, right? The high altitude cow, essentially. Everybody's seen these around here, right? American pika, they're running around the scree slopes at very high elevations, they do really well there. Maybe many people have not seen this one, like a cross between an Ewok and a rabbit. Right? This is the cousin to this pica. This is the Ely pica in Asia. There's only about a thousand of these things left. Very similar life history to these guys who live in very high mountain slopes. Does anybody recognize these birds up here? Bar-headed geese. They're famous for making a migration over the top of the Himalayas to get to the Tibetan plateau where they nest and breed. Right? So they fly at very high elevations. This is one of the cutest ones on the slide, I think. Anybody recognize that one? Very small. This is a jumping spider from the slopes of the Himalayas. So this thing actually lives up near 6,700 meters, 7,000 meters high, um, where there's nothing there. And so it actually feeds on wind-blown insects that get blown up onto the slopes and storms. It scurries around and finds those insects and eats them, because there's no local food, essentially. So all of these are really interesting and iconic organisms. But only one of them flies, and these guys are actually kind of wimps because they only do this for one to five days. So it's a hard migration, but it's short-lived, right? So they're not flying for very long. Turns out there are a whole bunch of really interesting insects that deal with all of the challenges of high altitude, cold temperatures, low oxygen, and flight, so low air density, all the time, okay? So this is a very complicated figure. So, and I can see that in your faces right now. So I'm gonna walk you through what's on here. There's a whole bunch of information on here. So as we move from this side of the graph to this side, we get increasing air density, right? So the greatest air density is associated with sea level. So over here is sea level, right? As we move from the bottom to the top of the graph, that's oxygen. And that's indicated by partial pressure of oxygen. So everywhere you go on Earth, the fraction of oxygen in the air is the same. It's the same here as it is in Florida, as it is on Everest. It's 21% roughly. But the total pressure of the surrounding air goes down. So it's a constant fraction of that total pressure. And that's that partial pressure. And that's really critical because that partial pressure outside, that's the driving force for getting oxygen into your lungs from your lungs into your blood, and from your blood into your tissues, right? So this driving force for getting oxygen into your system is critical. It's highest, right, at sea level. So if you, if you just walk along this line from sea level to higher elevations, both air density and partial pressure for oxygen decline. So as you get, go this way, it gets harder and harder, right? The color of the line indicates the changes in temperature, right? So you go from warm, to cold as you increase in altitude, okay? This scale over here just gives you an idea. Each horizontal white bar tells you what elevation you're at. So I'm at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 meters. And then these are records. I've been for many years really interested in old records in the literature of, of people encountering insects at high elevations and not just any insect but flying insects. And so you have grasshoppers that fly up above 4,000 meters. We have um, any fly fishermen in here or fisherwomen will recognize stoneflies, caddisflies, and mayflies. They get up to about 4,500 to 5,000 meters. We have true bugs up there as well. We get to about 5,000 to 5,500 meters, and we have bumblebees and, and carabid beetles. And we get even higher, and we occasionally see butterflies and small flies at even higher elevations.
okay? So there's lots of insects that actually are hanging out and dealing with all these challenges on a daily basis. The one that I wanna focus on today is this one, okay? In part, because they're just so charismatic, right? They're just cool. These are like the yaks of the insect world, right? Everybody notices right away that bumblebees are fuzzy, um, and that undoubtedly has something to do with their ability to deal with cold at high elevations. But bumblebees have been regularly collected, and I've regularly collected them above 5,000 meters, and the highest record is nearly 6,000 meters. So they're hanging out at these super high elevations. And we've collected nests, we found nests above 4,000 meters. So it's not like they're just hanging out down low and, and occasionally flying up the mountain to the high elevations and then going back down again. They're actually nesting at these high elevations. And they're tiny, right? A big bumblebee, it may look large and threatening to you, but it's not actually very big, right? And so a lot of these, these characteristics, these, these challenges that they should be facing are exacerbated by the fact that they're so small. So what I wanna to do today, oh, and I wanna tell you a little bit more about places that we found them, I forgot. Um, so this is one of our field sites in Western China, Lijiang, Yunnan province. So this is 2,500 meters, so a little higher than here, a little higher than Laramie. Lots and lots of very interesting bumblebees. Bumblebees are found at high elevations on just about every continent on Earth. Um, we can come back to the US, to Yosemite National Park, get up to the top of Mount Dana if you've been there. Beautiful flower meadows up there and bumblebees all over the place. How many people have been climbing in the mountains around here? You get to a nice alpine meadow and you see bumblebees, right? They're hard to miss. They're everywhere when you get to high elevations. And you can go even higher. This is one of our higher sites in Western China. Really interesting endemic poppy species that are essentially visited only by bumblebees that visit, that hang out these high elevations. And again, this is 4,500 to 5,000 meters up in the air. So this is very, very high. The interesting thing is that they're not only abundant at these high elevations, but they're also incredibly diverse. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a map where I've cut all of the areas of the world that are um, above 2,000 meters, I've colored them red. Okay, so just kind of get that image in your mind of where all the high spots in the world are. And now what I'm gonna do is overlay a map that shows the color-coded number of species of bumblebees. So red indicates lots of species, blue indicates few species, okay? So hopefully you see that wherever you have mountains, you have lots of bumblebee species. And this is particularly striking. Most of us know that if you get to the lowland tropics and you're a biologist or ecologist, that's where you go to see species diversity. Everything's super diverse in the lowland Amazon, right? Bumblebees, there's only two species. In the neighboring Andes, there's 12 to 15, right? So they're super diverse at high altitudes as well, in contrast to lots of their relatives and other organisms. So with that in mind, they're a really nice case for trying to understand how it is that organisms deal with these challenges. And so what I wanna do is walk through some of our work that we've done trying to look at these different challenges. And we're gonna start with cold temperatures. Now I wanna warn you, I'm gonna give you little snippets of, of the information of, of this data, and, and I hope that I'm gonna provide plenty of time at the end so that you can ask questions about the things that you're most interested in, okay? So I'm gonna give you snippets of these things. So here's this bumblebee. It has to deal with this strong decrease in temperature. There's a very rich and fascinating history of study looking at thermoregulatory capabilities of bumblebees. They're actually really, really good at regulating temperature. So good, in fact, that if I were to take a fancy thermal camera and take an image of this bee, it would look something like this. The thorax, that chest cavity where all the flight muscles are, and the head are really hot. In fact, a bumblebee has to heat up to about 35 C, about 95 degrees Fahrenheit, before it even takes off, right? And when it's flying, it's flying, its core temperature is at about 105 degrees Fahrenheit. So what would be a fever in you and I, this guy is, is flying around at that temperature. Okay, so they regulate incredibly high temperatures. To put this in perspective, we all know, you know, you have to be very, very careful with infants that, that they don't overheat or get too cold, right? And that's because of this surface area to volume problem. They have a whole bunch of surface area and not a lot of mass. And so they lose heat really rapidly from their core. So you have to make sure they're all wrapped up and stay warm. So imagine taking an infant and shrinking it down to the size of a bumblebee, right? That's the, the problem that these guys face. They have huge surface area relative to volume and yet they're able to regulate really high temperatures, 
So this is a really interesting thing that we've studied for many, many years. Many people have studied this. But uh, there's a little twist here. It's meant that we tend to view the idea that just because they can regulate temperature, they don't have limits. In other words, they don't get too cold or too hot. And we've recently realized that this has been a big oversight in the literature. And I want to tell you a little bit of why we should think they should have limits. So let's think about people. Again, you regulate a core body temperature, right? 37C, 98.6, give or take a degree or so, depending on your gender and what time of day it is and all those things. But as soon as you get a little bit too cold, you can go into mild hypothermia, you get that uncontrolled shivering, right? And you get even colder than that, you get into that comatose state like Beck Weathers. And if you're in that state for too long, you can die, right? So that lower limit where your physiology starts to fail because you get too cold, for organisms, we would call this a critical thermal minimum, okay? So it's critical because it's, an, it's a limit at which your physiology changes. You're no longer in control of your temperature. You're potentially comatose. Same thing at the upper end. If you start to get a little too hot, you can get, start to get feverish. You go beyond that, you can get heat exhaustion and or heat stroke. And if you don't cool yourself down quickly enough, you can have irreversible damage to your system, right? And so that's a critical thermal maximum. So when we talk about organisms other than humans, we tend to use these terms, but they're analogs to what we're used to experiencing and talking about, okay? So it turns out that nobody had ever entertain the idea that, that bumblebees might have these limits, in part because they have such fantastic ability to regulate temperature, just kind of, oh, they don't have to worry about this, right? And so um, I have a fantastic graduate student, Kenan Oyen, who came to my lab from Fairbanks, Alaska, where she was intimately familiar with what it's like to be cold. Um, and she had studied a lot of insects and what their cold tolerance was. And so we spent a couple of years building this um, complicated setup. But it's not really that complicated. I'm going to show you what it does. So this right here is a thermal block. It's just a piece of aluminum that we can circulate water through. And it has a heater and a cooler on it. And those heater and coolers are controlled by this black box. So we can set any temperature we want in that box and have it ramp up and down so that we can change the temperature of organisms on this block. These little vials here, we can throw a bee into it, put it on the block, and then ramp its temperature up and down. And then we can put uh, little tiny thermocouples with little tiny thermometers essentially in that block. We can embed them in the core tissue of the bee. They're that small. And we can also put them in the surrounding um, vial. And so we can track the temperatures that they're experiencing and their core temperature as we slowly cool or warm up. And so what I'm going to show you, um, very few people have actually seen. Um, my student sent this to me just a few days ago. Um, we put a camera in here to videotape, to film what's happening in these blocks when we have bees on those. And so I'm going to show you a behavior that had never before been described until my student found it. And so what I want you to do is focus on this bee right here. She's moving a little bit. You see that wing flutter? And now she's going to lie down, and now she's comatose. This is at a temperature near zero. So she's been ramping down slowly over time to get to this cold temperature. Let me be clear, she's totally fine. If we pull this vial out and set it on the desktop, she'll wake up and walk around as if nothing happened. So she gets to this critical thermal minimum, and it's going to start over again. Um, when she hits that minimum, she loses control of her body. She goes comatose and then she can recover from that. You can tell this one has not yet hit that stage and all the rest of these have. You see how they're all laying down on their sides. So they've hit that lower critical temperature, all right? On the hot end, it looks a little different. It, they're hot, so they're moving really quickly. So you slowly ramp this temperature up to try to figure out what temperature are they not, no longer gonna be able to um, handle that high temperature. That's it right there. Did you see as she stopped moving, started to curl? As soon as they hit that, we pull them off as quickly as we can to make sure that we don't damage them. So they have both a lower critical limit and an upper critical limit that hadn't been documented before. So that's neat, but getting back to altitude, we might expect, because temperatures are colder at higher altitudes, we might, you might all have a prediction in your head, right? Which is that high altitude bumblebees should be able to tolerate colder temperatures, 
That's how they might live at those high elevations, okay? So we wanted to test that idea. To do that, we went to a bunch of field sites in Western California where we've done work before. And at those field sites, we have a number of sites that vary in elevation. Now these elevations are in feet, so they're not particularly high actually relative to where we can find bumblebees. But to find bumblebee queens is difficult, particularly early spring. So we have this range from about sea level up to about 7,000 feet where we've collected queens. Now this idea of collecting queens and then testing her young is, uh, their young is really, really important. So just as, let's say you have some family from Florida that come to Jackson and visit for this festival, what, what out there might feel just fine to you because you've been here all summer and you've acclimated to these conditions, they're gonna be freezing out there, right? So acclimation is a really, really important concept that affects these organisms as well. And what we wanted to test is whether or not we saw local adaptation in these characteristics rather than acclimation. So the way we did that is collect these queens, bring them into the lab, and with a colleague at Utah State University, we can actually rear nests from these queens. So here's a queen, you see this really big bee. These are all of her young, all of whom are sisters. From the moment that those eggs are laid, for these workers here, all these little um, adult bees, from the moment they were an egg, up until their, the time that we test them, they all experienced exactly the same conditions in the lab. So there's no opportunity for acclimation. So any difference we see have to be because of local adaptation in that queen's genetic makeup that allows her to tolerate these colder temperatures. All right, so after we do that, after we measure this, we rear up um, several hundred queen uh, nests from queens in the lab. About a year and a half later, we can actually test them. And we wanna test that prediction. Do we see, um, can high altitude bees tolerate colder temperatures? And so what we expect to see is that as we get out to high elevation, right, bees from these higher places, we expect them to be able to tolerate lower temperatures. And indeed, that's what we see. So bees from, collected from 7,000 feet, let me modify that, bees reared from queens collected from 7,000 feet, right, can tolerate temperatures down to about minus four or minus five degrees C. So that's very cold relative to these sea level bees that are right around zero or so before they fail. So certainly they, they have evolved cold tolerance to be able to deal with these higher temperatures. And so one of the things that we're doing now is going even higher and looking at this with other species. Now you might be thinking, I showed you those, that critical thermal maximum data, and you might think, well, it doesn't get as hot at high elevations, potentially, and so maybe they don't have as high of heat tolerance, right? They lose some heat tolerance. Well, it turns out that's not true. We see no difference in heat tolerance across elevation, so they maintain high heat tolerance. And I could talk with you more about this later. This is a very common pattern we see in a lot of organisms. There's no change in heat tolerance across latitude, across altitude, um, and it seems to be that you just have to maintain tolerance to really high temperatures because once you get over that edge, it's very, very quickly you reach damage. Whereas on the cold end, you have a lot more space there. Okay. All right, so you might say, well, okay, where are we going next with this? This is actually a very small part of a much bigger project. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of recent work that has documented range shifts of lots of different species of bumblebees in response to ch climate change. So warming climates means that when bees used to, so here's the historical distribution of this species I just showed you data for. These lines indicate the distributions. The historical distributions are dotted and the current distributions are solid. So you see at that southern range limit, as climate has warmed, populations that used to be further south, they're no longer there. We only find them further north. We've seen similar patterns across elevation. So here's altitudinal ranges. Here's the historical uh, distribution is this uh, white box, mean historical distribution, and they're shifting upward in elevation. And it's pretty clear that this shift is driven by climate change. And one of the things that we're trying to do then is characterize for a whole bunch of different populations from Southern California all the way up into Alaska, and for a bunch of different species, what are these thermal tolerance limits? Because you can imagine if temperatures in a local uh, place ever fall below the temperature you can tolerate, you're probably not gonna survive there long. Or vice versa, if they ever fall above temperatures you can't tolerate, you're probably not gonna survive there long. So these thermal tolerance limits potentially provide us a really nice mechanistic way to link changes in climate with changes in species distributions. So we can predict where these bees will be. Why do we care? 
Bees are incredibly important pollinators. So you lose those pollinators in local ecosystems, it cascades through all of the plants that depend on them, okay? So that's where we're going with this. So that's all I wanted to talk about temperature. And now I wanna shift into this oxygen and air density. Um, and so here's a bee flying. That's its tongue. Yeah, so they'll open that tongue up as they're approaching a flower, so they're ready to, to get in there and get the nectar out. And you can see the motions of its wings. I, I like to show this picture because I think it reminds a lot of people of a helicopter, right? You see kind of this wash of wings and they're hovering with those wings doing this just like a helicopter. So they face that same problem of reduced air density. So one of the things that we wanted to do is ask, well, what are the ways that we might detect if oxygen and air density are actually limiting where bumblebees go, and in particular, whether or not they can fly. Okay, so we wanna look for signatures that might indicate that these are limitations. And so to, to, to give you an idea of what these signatures might look like, I wanna show you this. Okay, so on the right here, I have a glider, right? Very, very long wings, high surface area, super, super light. Um, piece of equipment, right? So it takes basically no power once this thing is airborne for it to glide for as long as it wants, okay? This is very similar to an albatross, right? This is this big seabird. These things will glide for thousands of miles for single meals and then come back. And they can stay aloft for hours and hours and hours and hours and days with very little energy expenditure because they have huge wings relative to their bodies, right? On the left, here's a fighter jet, very short stubby wings, very heavy bodied. It can do amazing things in the air, but it burns a whole heck of a lot of gas doing it, right? It takes a lot of energy. It's a very energy expensive thing to do. Very similar to a hummingbird. Short stubby wings, they do amazing things in your yard. They have to feed every 20 minutes or they'll die, right? They burn that much energy. Okay, so if we're, from an aerodynamics perspective, the way we would describe these things as having, as having differences in wing loading. So these over here, if you think about the term wing loading, it's how, how much weight are you putting on your wings? So these over here, because they have such large wings relative to the weight of the aircraft, they have very low wing loading, right? These over here, because they have such heavy bodies relative to the size of their wings, they have high wing loading. There's a big load on those wings. Because of these energetic considerations, right, we actually would predict, that as we went to higher elevations, we would see a pattern across bumblebees that would reflect these wing loading differences. So if I go to high elevation, there's fewer molecules for me to push down against given a, the way my wings are to begin with, right? If I just have a bigger wing, I can push more molecules down per unit time and offset that lift challenge. And so the prediction is that bees at high elevation, and I've exaggerated it here so you can see it, have much bigger wings relative to the size of their bodies than do bees at low elevation. Okay, so that's the prediction that would suggest some limitation. And so to test this prediction, we went to um, Yosemite, um, where we have a lot, a very good altitudinal gradient, lots of bee species, went out, captured lots and lots of bee species with the help of some field assistants, and are able to sort of measure the mass of those bees, and then also use some computer programs to actually measure the area of those wings, so we can measure this wing loading for all of these different bee species, and then answer this question. And when we do that, we see exactly what we predicted. Okay, so each of these points is for a different bee species, collected at a different elevation up to about 3,500 meters. When we get to high elevations, bees have much larger wings relative to their body size than do bees at low elevations, okay, just as you would predict. So they look a lot more like gliders than they do like hummingbirds when they're at high eleva or low elevations. Okay, so that's interesting evidence suggesting that oxygen and, and in particular air density is limiting where bees are found. Um, but we wanted to go a step further. And this really came out of some conversations with some aerodynamics folks, some flight folks. We said, well, we see them at these high places. Is there a spot where they can't go? In other words, are air densities and oxygens on Earth that they would experience on Earth actually limiting them? Are they just so overbuilt that it doesn't really matter and we're, we're barking up the wrong tree here? Um, so we went back 
And for these projects, we went to Western China, which is the center of, of um, bumblebee diversity, about 60 to 70 species of bumblebees in an area the size of Texas, basically. Um, the, it's where the Tibetan Plateau falls off down to Chengdu to the Sichuan Valley, so we have amazing altitudinal gradients to do these studies. And we went out to these places with colleagues at Berkeley and also our colleagues at Sichuan University. We said, we're gonna see whether or not, how quickly we can get bees to fail. And to do this, we built um, these flight chambers out of plexiglass, half-inch plexiglass glued together with a nice little lid. And I took this out there the first year. We collected bees in the field at about 3,000 meters. I think it was the second bee that we had done. It's very um, expensive and difficult to get to China to do field work, right? So the second bee that we threw in this chamber, we're pumping and the bees flying. We're pumping air out of the chamber and the bees flying, right? So what we can do is manipulate barometric pressure in that chamber and elevate that bee up the mountain as if it was flying higher and higher in elevation. So we're just constantly sucking air out of that chamber, sucking air. Our forearms are getting tired. The bee's still flying. The half-inch plexiglass starts flexing. The bee's still flying. It shatters and the bee flies away. <laughs> so we did other things that field season because that was the only chamber we had. I rebuilt the chamber, and now you can see it's a bit like Alvin the Submersible. This is inch thick plexiglass, rubber gaskets, bolts, um, so that we could actually get the pressure low enough to make these bees fail. So that was a big surprise. And so what we did is we caught these bees at about 3,000 meters, and then we asked them to fly. We put them in the chamber. They naturally try to fly to escape. Then we dropped the pressure to simulate moving up in elevation by about 500 meters. We asked them to fly again, and we just kept doing that until they stopped flying. Okay, and the idea was let's see whether or not these things fail and whether or not oxygen and air density challenge them. Now keep in mind, when we're changing total barometric pressure, we're both decreasing the amount of oxygen in that chamber and we're decreasing the air density. So it's both harder for them to breathe and it's harder for them to fly. So this should be really, really challenging. To our surprise, they can summit Everest. So these blue points, let me walk you through this real quick. These blue points are for six individual bees that we show data on here. Um, this is the highest altitude at which they, they pretty easily flew. In other words, they just hovered in that chamber for us. This is the, the red dots are the lowest altitudes at which they failed. In other words, no matter how much we tried to get them to fly, they wouldn't fly. Okay, so there could be some behavior in here. And the, and the purple dots here just indicate then our best estimate of the maximum altitude they can fly, which is somewhere between the, this and this, right? So four of the six, they're flying right around 7,500, 8,000 meters. Remember, Everest is 8,848. Two of the bees flew just fine up to about 9,200 meters equivalent. So there's a quarter of the amount of oxygen, right? And there's, there's, there's no molecules to push against. Like we couldn't believe that they could do this. So this amazing capacity to both deliver oxygen to their tissues and to produce forces for flight. We went a step further and we took a bunch of other fancy equipment so we could actually measure what they were doing with their wings. And so, this is actually from a different species. This is work of another of my graduate students. And so in here, what we have is a mirror underneath the bee, so that you oriented at 45 degrees, so you can see both a side view of the bee and a top view of the bee as it's flying. And the reason I want to show you this, hopefully you see what they're doing with those wings, right? So they're moving those wings forward and stopping them, and then they're moving them back and stopping them, right? This angle through which they're beating their wings as they go forward and back, that angular extent of wing motion, we call the stroke amplitude. And you can imagine if I'm flying and I'm doing this, right? I'm not pushing many air molecules down, right? But if I'm doing this, I'm pushing a lot more. Okay, so an easy prediction from aerodynamic theory is simply that they'll increase that stroke amplitude. They'll beat their wings through a wider angle. And indeed, when we look at lots and lots of high-speed video and measure this, that's what we see. So on the left here are those bees at their capture elevation, 3,200 meters about. And this shows the furthest forward they beat their wings, right? And the furthest back their wings went on these average strokes. And so you see that's the stroke amplitude. The blue is what they're doing with their wings when they get up to those failure or pre-failure flight elevations. So at this point, they're beating them way further forward and way further back. 
Now, I want to plant an idea in your head here. Clearly, there's a limit. And we see this with, bum, with uh, hummingbirds. We've done similar studies on hummingbirds. What's the limit? What's the maximum angle through which you can beat one, side, one wing? 180 degrees. Because at 180 degrees, you're smacking your wings together. And that's not good, right? So they, they definitely reach a limit at some point, And so that will limit how, far, how high they can go. In this case, there's a little stop over the wing here. And so they can't actually get it f much further than that. So we think this is the maximum amplitude that they can actually achieve. Okay, so they change stroke amplitude. Now these were individual bees that we captured at a particular elevation and then asked to fly. But you might be thinking, well, but what if you compared bees that you captured at low elevation with those that you captured at high elevation? Are they doing different things with their wings, right? Because those were mostly just kind of me medium elevation bees. And so to test this idea, do bees that live at higher elevations just always fly with higher stroke amplitudes? In other words, we're not manipulating pressure. We're just capturing them at their site and measuring what they're doing with their wings. Um, we went to two different sites in, in western China. Again, one at 2,000 meters, Wolong, famous for the panda reserve there, um, and then one at 4,500 meters in Balangshan Yako. And so at these two sites, we can measure just at the local elevation what are bees doing with their wings to fly there. And indeed, we see exactly that same pattern. We see a bunch of bees that we measure up here. They're flying with higher stroke amplitudes, bigger angles that they're beating their wings through. Bees at lower elevations are flying with lower stroke amplitudes. The problem with these data is that there are four different species, and they vary strikingly in morphology. So um, it could be that they're different, not because of elevation, but because they're different species and they're shaped differently. And so what we did is we repeated these experiments, again using these chambers, so here's a bee that's landed after just having flown at the equivalent of 9,000 meters elevation. So it's landed on our little GPS. Um, um, and we do these up in these high mountains so that we can catch them immediately and get them into the chambers and fly them so there's no behavioral problems. So we basically take each individual bee, move it up the mountain within the chamber and down the mountain within the chamber by adding air. And in that way, we can actually test whether or not bees at this, tested at the same elevations are doing different things. And so if you catch a bunch of bees at 2,000 meters, this low altitude, and you, each one of these connected lines is a single bee where we've measured their stroke amplitude across a range of altitudes, they show that same pattern that I just showed you, right? They increase stroke amplitude or that angle to fly at higher elevations. All of these bees were collected at this 2,000 meter site, and we just experimentally in that chamber moved them up and down the mountain. So you could say, what happens if you collect bees at 4,500 4, meters? Turns out species doesn't matter, morphology doesn't matter. They look identical to these low altitude bees, which is very surprising on the one hand, but it also suggests that the physics of flight in these conditions are just so constraining, they can't get around having to change their wing beats in this way, okay? So hopefully I've convinced you that alpine bumblebees are both more cold tolerant, right? So they reach that chill coma at a much lower temperature. They have relatively larger wings and they fly at these high elevations with increased stroke amplitude. But if seeing it up here is not enough, um, I have a suggestion for you. We actually have, I've collaborated with the Biodiversity Institute and with um, the School for Energy Resources has a 3D visualization center. So we've created an Xbox Connect game out there. And so what you can do is you can actually manipulate the size of your wings by flapping like this or like this. And you can manipulate the frequency and the amplitude of your wings and try to fly a hummingbird from, or sorry, a butter, a bumblebee from flower to flower as it tries to climb a mountain. And hopefully you get a direct sense of how difficult it is to fly at high elevations. So please go out there and try it. I think it's right outside here. Um, with that, I'll thank funding agencies, particularly National Geographic, which has funded a lot of the China work, and also the National Science Foundation, which funds a lot of my ongoing stuff, and our collaborators and students. And I'd be happy to take questions if we have time. You explained uh, why the research you do on bees is so important because bees are so important. Yeah. 
Uh, is there any relevant uh, findings uh, for human beings directly in what you've discovered? Um, so there's a couple of things. Um, we're learning more and more what drives where it is that we find pollinators like bees. And so there's a very direct impact of that on our food supply, for example. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that um, I don't do this as much, but a lot of my colleagues actually rely on this sort of biomimetic approaches to design things like small flying vehicles. And so there's actually a group at Harvard that has used a lot of our data to build a robo-bee. And the idea is that figuring out how to miniaturize flight apparatus, it's very, very difficult. And by mimicking the biology, we get better and better ideas about how to do that. And so if you just look up robo-bee, um, Harvard, you'll find all these really great videos of these micro-air vehicles that are, they're bigger than bees, but they're pretty close, um, that can actually fly around and hover pretty well. And so we're learning a lot on the sort of engineering side from being able to look at these animals. Um, th the other thing I'll say is that um, the more we look into these sort of basic research questions, the more we realize there's stuff we should have been paying attention to but we didn't know well enough in terms of making applications. So for example, the flight muscles of bumblebees, they're more like heart. So they actually take, they're more like your beating heart. So they're more like cardiac muscle. So um, to be able to operate at 250 times a second, that muscle, um, it can't have a nervous impulse every second, every time it beats. And so it has a single nervous impulse and then the stretching of that thorax causes the opposing muscles to flex and then they stretch the other muscles, which flex, and they do that 10 or 15 times, and you get another ner nervous impulse. So if you think about your heart, you have a pacemaker in your heart that's causing it to continually pump that way. And so actually this flight muscle is now being considered as a, as a sort of model muscle tissue for looking at heart function as well. If we had gone into it thinking that's what, we, there's no way we would have gone into it thinking that's what we would do with that, with that animal. But the discoveries led to us going, oh, this is a great model for heart. So, yeah, I've got one up there and then. I actually have two questions. Um, my first question is, is on the Everest study where you had the bees that could fly at Everest. The bees that you used for that study, were they all captured at the same altitude? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. And then my second question is, is bees in nature as opposed to domesticated bees and the uh, collapse of colonies, can you speak as to whether there's a difference between the collapse on colonies for the bees found at altitude in nature and those that are domesticated? Yeah, colony collapse disorder uh, is, is this finding that with honeybees, Right, um, many of these colonies, for example, last year, I think about three, three to four, three-fifths, two-fifths to three-fifths of all colonies in the United States died over the winter. Um, and more and more we're realizing that that's probably driven for honeybees by a whole combination of factors from uh, pesticides to uh, potentially climate change to the fact that they're housed in these massive groups. It's basically like a big hospital, right? So spread of disease through these colonies can be rampant. So there's a bunch of reasons for that. Honeybees, of course, are not native to the US. They were brought here from Europe and they're used primarily in managed situations. Bumblebees um, are both native and they're also managed. So you can buy colonies of bumblebees to put in your greenhouse and they do them in large agricultural settings. So we know there's lots of data for honeybees that there's been lots of decline in those populations. More and more we're finding that native bees, bumblebees included, are also in serious decline. So um, the first seven species to be listed um, endangered species um, bees to be listed on the endangered species list were just listed two weeks ago. There's just some Hawaiian white-faced bees. Um, there's a bee, there's two bumblebee species that um, used to be all over the west coast and also all throughout the east. Um, we haven't found them for 15 years. Those are likely driven by combinations of things, again, climate change, land use changes, pesticides are now a big thing, and also disease. So it turns out that um, in domesticating a lot of the bumblebees, there's a particular species that they domesticated, Bombus occidentalis, and it crashed. Commercial production of it crashed a number of years ago. They're not sure why, it was basically a rampant uh, a virus outbreak. Subsequent to that crash, wild populations of that bee started crashing. 
and basically disappeared from the west coast. We still have that species in, in this state, um, but we don't know a lot about it. Um, and so we're actually really interested in, in documenting where that species is found. So I think we have lots of data on honeybees, less data on native bees. Most of the data that we have on native bees suggests they're in serious decline and we better wake up and figure out what we're gonna do about it. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. I wonder if you could speak to energy use over out the altitude range. Um, you yeah. know, are, are low elevation bees using less energy than bees at high altitudes? I'm, I'm really glad you asked. That's actually one of the things we're working on right now. Um, so I mentioned this idea that you might offset uh, the challenges of flight at high altitude by changing morphology and kinematics. But as you mentioned, this energy thing is really interesting. So you can fly at high elevation, but you're burning so much energy, it's not, it's, it doesn't pay off essentially, right? You gotta be able to fly from flower to flower to flower to collect energy, but you're burning more energy than you're, than you're taking in. So we're in the process right now of doing a whole bunch of experiments in the lab where we can actually measure energy consumption of these things during flight in different conditions. So I don't know the answer yet, but I imagine that that, that trade-off exists, and that's why we don't fi find them as high as they could potentially fly. It's an energy restraint, yeah. You know, it would seem to me that in the same species, bees at different elevations, uh, well, part of it would be the water wingspan, mm -hmm. but they would seem to be different genetically or mm -hmm. epigenetically. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if you could comment on that. Exactly. So I sort of showed the difference in cold tolerance. That's within a species between populations across elevation. So I'm working with collaborators at um, University of Alabama, and he's a genomics guy. And so for all of these bees that we've done, that we've collected in the field and that we've tested in the lab, we actually are doing full genomes for nearly a thousand bees. And so we'll be able to compare very specifically what the genomes of those animals look like. In other words, the genetic structures of those organisms look like across elevation. And we're also doing um, uh, transcriptomes. So you can have a sort of genetic code that you read to create essentially the, the molecules that make you up and determine how you respond to temperature, for example. But your transcript, you could have exactly the same genetic code, but what you actually transcribe, that is what you actually turn into useful molecules could be totally different. And so we're measuring both of those things right now. So I think you're absolutely right. We expect to see strong differences in both the transcriptome and potentially the genome between these populations. But it'll be another year or so before we get through all those data. Yeah. How do you collect the material to uh, ascertain what the, the DNA or the genome is of these little guys? It's amazing. Uh, you can take as little as half of a leg of a bumblebee, and current technologies are such that you can amplify that and then sequence that entire genome. Um, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. So we basically, it's gotten to where what we do is we collect these animals in the wild, we put them in a, basically a salty solution that protects um, the DNA and the RNA. We send those samples to a company and they send us back hard drives with terabytes of data saying, here are the genomes for all of your animals. It's pretty remarkable what they can do now. Um, so it takes very, very little tissue. In fact, one of the next stages that we're looking at, we've done the entire animal to start, is to start actually doing it by organ system. So we're really interested in flight muscles independent of the heart, independent of the brain, right? Um, independent of the gut, and we can actually do that with an animal the size of a bumblebee now. Yeah. You said that, that the West Coast bee yeah. It had totally collapsed, but that you find it here in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Do you have any assumption or thought as to why it's still here and not out there? What, what's making it still be viable here? Yeah, so it's very controversial. So I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give you the spiel. Um, uh, this is being recorded, so I worry about the controversy. <laughs> but I'll, I'll give you the ideas. Um, so. I mentioned that it was a species that was in commercial production. 
it collapsed due to disease within that commercial production. Literally, the companies that were huge, multi-million dollar companies went under overnight because it just rampantly went through all their colonies and killed them. Um, there was not tight control on where they put those colonies and whether or not those colonies, individuals from those colonies got out. And so they would put them in greenhouses that have opening windows and doors. And, and there's been a number of studies that suggest that it's very easy for those colony bees to kind of wander out of the greenhouse and end up being out in the wild. And so one idea behind that, where most of these colonies were placed was on the West Coast in farms. In those colonies, we had this path, what we call pathogen spillover. So essentially, in that sort of hospital setting of, of, of ma major commercialization, you generated these strains of pathogens that were particularly nasty. They escaped into the wild and then just phew, wiped everything out on that coast. Now, that's a hypothesis. We don't know that for sure. But it makes sense in light of the fact that they're, they're still here. And part of the reason they're still here, we think, is that there's nobody here. <laughs> Right? There's half a million people in Wyoming, and most of the state is beautiful mountainous country that's not messed with. And these bees tend to like that sort of middle elevation to high elevation habitat. Um, and you might have seen them. They're very characteristic. If you see a bee around that's got a white fuzzy butt, it's the only one that's got white on its abdomen. And so you might have seen them in your gardens here. You might have seen them in the mountains around here. They're a species that they're actually very seriously trying to figure out whether or not they need to list them. And so I have a student right now who's surveying throughout the state to try to figure out where they're found, how common they are, how abundant they are. So that's the hypothesis. We don't know for sure. You mentioned that the bees in Southern California and those places were starting to migrate uh, north due to climate change. What is that rate? Is it increasing a lot? with studies or is it pretty slow right now? And is it affecting, has there been any data that it affects the plant life down there from their migration? Yeah, th these are great questions. Um, unfortunately, we've, the paper, the, the group that discovered these range shifts, so I, I've distinguished slightly between the migration and a range shift. So the idea is that the range has shifted, meaning where you used to find them down south, just sampling any time of, that you would sample bees, you no longer find them. And the furthest south you find them is now much further north, right? So this range shift, um, this was discovered last year. So, so we have no idea yet if it's changing. Um, and it's a really nice paper because unlike most insects, bumblebees have actually been fairly well characterized, fairly well sampled. And so a lot of the complaints people might have about sampling problems um, that you would have with other insects, we don't have that with bumblebees. And so in this paper, they very carefully laid out all of the possible hypotheses for why these ranges could be shifting. Could be, that, oh, well, we just haven't looked enough down south lately. Right? No, the sampling's even better than it was 30 years ago, right? So there's lots of alternative land use changes. Well, maybe it's just land use, it has nothing to do with climate. If you look at the patterns of land use change, they just don't match the shifts that we see in ranges. So we don't know if it's speeding up, if it's new, we don't know how new it is. Um, in terms of the effect on the local plant populations, we don't know. Again, we just discovered this last year, or it was just published last year. With colony collapse, has there been a noticeable decline in pollinated crops? And, and are the people that are depending on those crops, are they interested in funding your research? I would have to check the data. I mean, I think people have been able to compensate for loss of colonies and still get their crops largely pollinated. Now, there are particular crops that are really interesting because, for example, uh, almond crops in California, the time window for pollinating that crop is about two to three weeks. That's it. And so what's happened there is they've, there's been mismatch in time, so due to phenological differences, so changes in timing of spring, essentially, such that those local pollinators, native pollinators, um, many of you may know about orchard mason bees, uh, um, osmia is what they're called, um, they, they kind of weren't around. And so then now many honeybee producers who used to make their money by kind of jumping around to different crops and following the wave, they go to California for two weeks make all of their money for the year, and then the rest of the year they just kind of do a few other odd jobs with those bees. Because the demand for that particular crop, it's such a narrow time window, and the productivity of those almonds and what they're able to get from them is enough that they can pay for it. Um, so 
I, I think there, we're, we're on the cusp of a change in the way we think about pollination in crops. Um, historically, we've thought, well, we've got to manage the honeybees and we've got to put them in the crop and then we've got to make sure we have enough honeybees that they pollinate the crop. There's been a shift um, that we realize we actually have lots of really good native pollinators. And if you break up your crops by adding in hedgerows of, of wildflowers that attract those native pollinators, you may not have to buy honeybee services. And so there's been a bit of a change in whether or not that's gonna work for all crops um, and whether or not um, we're gonna really shift away from honeybees, um, that's still up in the air. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, so certainly the families that have, have for generations have raised honeybees, that's not a good thing for them to lose their livelihood. But we may be shifting away from them over time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks.